Welcome to the EKG Guy. I'm glad you could join us if this is your first time. Welcome back if you're returning. So we're going through our EKG coding reference guide that we've now made available online. So those of you that don't have access, you can simply get access by going to this link here. Okay. And once you get there, you'll enter your email and then you'll click submit. From there, you'll be directed to your email to a link. And then at that link, you'll click it and then you'll have access to this here. Okay. And if you're a returning guest, obviously you can use that uh, URL put your email in and you'll bypass that whole pathway. So what we're doing now is looking at atrial fibrillation in this lecture. We've gone through the general features, okay? So you can go back and look at the atrial abnormality, so enlargement, uh, both left and right and biatrial. We've gone through a number of uh, other features there. And then now we're in the rhythm section, so part two. So as you can see, we have a ways to go, but we're in part two, we've gone through sinus rhythms. And now we're uh, we just finished atrial flutter, and now we're going to get to atrial fibrillation, okay? So a common topic uh, that a lot of us want to know how to identify because this has actually uh, the ability to change patient management if we can identify it and document it. So let's get started. So atrial fibrillation. So what is going on in this case? Well, this is random chaotic atrial firing, okay? And because of that, what we see on the EKG is indiscernible absent P waves with an irregularly irregular ventricular rate, okay? So let's try to break that down, okay? So just so you're aware, there's been two proposed mechanisms for atrial fibrillation. So if you draw our heart here, here's our right atrium and our left atrium right ventricle and left ventricle, okay? And atrial fibrillation, as the name implies, means that this is happening in the atria. Now, what happens is that there's two different things that can happen. You can have focal activation, or you can have these things called multiple wavelets. And we won't go into much detail. We do that in our course. But what, in general, what's going on is if you have focal activation, this tends to come somewhere near the pulmonary veins. So here's a pulmonary vein that enters the left atrium, and there tends to be focal activation somewhere near there, okay? And from there, you have these different wave that can form and you have firing within the atria, okay, from that area. Another uh, form that you could have, or means by which way this can come about, is that you have these multiple wavelets, okay? And what happens in there, you can imagine these circular wavelets throughout the atria, and they pretty much go within and out of each other, okay? And they're just constantly going throughout and you can imagine them circling uh, within each other, and that just pretty much continues. So there's two different pretty much proposed mechanisms there, but there also has to be an inciting event, okay? Usually it's a premature atrial contraction, okay, that may set it off, so some inciting event. So aside from those mechanisms, you need one, an inciting event or beat, Okay, and the second is having the substrate. And what do we mean by substrate? Well, something that can maintain this atrial fibrillation, that it can continue, okay? Now, there's some patients that have what we call paroxysmal atrial fibrillation where it comes on and off, and it's sometimes hard to detect um, in many of those cases. And that can really be difficult when we're trying to determine management. And we've been trying to use artificial intelligence more recently to try to solve some of those problems. So with a substrate, what I mean by that is that if you imagine if there's more area, okay, the, the left atrium is enlarged, whether it's from mitral stenosis or back pressure or some inherent disorder, you can imagine if you have more substrate or more area that this wave that forms can take about, you can imagine that that can propagate and continue this, okay? So anyways, uh, what I want to get into uh, more importantly is being able to identify it on the EKG, okay? So that's an important thing. And what we're seeing is that there's indiscernible absent P waves because there's no good atrial depolarization, okay? You just have fibrillation of the atria, not really good atrial contraction, and therefore you don't see good P waves. So there's no P waves here. This is actually a T wave, and so is this one, and this, and this, okay? So these are T waves that are occurring. There's no P waves that are here. Notice that these are also irregularly irregular. And what do we mean by that? Well, from one R wave, to the next R wave, 
is an R to R interval. And if you were to look at all of these R to R intervals, notice that the duration between these intervals is all different, okay? So we call that an irregularly irregular rhythm. And atrial fibrillation is the most common of these irregularly irregular rhythms. So what can cause this? Well, you can have congenital heart disease if it's not uh, you know, repaired. You can have cardiomyopathy. Any form of toxicity may cause it, rheumatic heart disease that affects the mitral valve. Uh, there can be a familial form, any drugs, inhalants, and ischemia can even uh, produce this or at least incite it. So what do we have to see here? Well, if you see atrial activity, you tend to see these fibrillatory, these small F waves with no organized pattern, okay? So we don't really see it here. Maybe you can see it in this down here in lead three, but there's, this is an example where we don't really see too much of it. Maybe here, but it almost looks isoelectric. Sometimes you can have these little waves between the QRS complexes that are little fibrillations, okay, we call them. And depending on how high those fibrillations are, okay, if they're more than one millimeter in duration or in uh, amplitude, so if you imagine here this, if it's greater than one millimeter in amplitude, okay, if you one small box that is, so that's not drawn proportionally. So if you imagine, let's draw it here. If this amplitude is at least one millimeter or go, more than one millimeter, we call that coarse atrial fibrillation. Okay, if it's less than one millimeter, then we call it fine atrial fibrillation. Okay, so less than that. And if it's a flat line, almost like we see here, we call this an isoelectric. Okay, so different ways to classify atrial fibrillation. So aside from, you know, being able to determine that this is atrial fibrillation present, the other thing is you want to classify it by its ventricular rate. Okay, so ventricular rate is how we classify it. And in doing so, this can help us then say if the patient is in atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, which you may have heard as AFib with RVR. So let's determine that. That's pretty much based on the ventricular rate. So if it's less than 60 beats per minute, we call that slow ventricular rate. So atrial fibrillation with a slow ventricular rate. If it's between 60 and 100 beats per minute, we call that atrial fibrillation with a controlled ventricular rate. And if it's more than 100 beats per minute, we call that atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular rate or RVR. Okay, so let's look and determine what we have here. So we know that atrial fibrillation is present. Okay, and we're going to say with what? Okay, so if we find the uh, rate, the ventricular rate, we'll be able to determine that. So we know that from beginning to end is 10 seconds okay of our standard 12 lead ekg in front of you and 10 seconds times 6 is 60 seconds which is one minute so now all you have to do is calculate the or count the number of complexes multiply it by 6 and you'll be able to get an estimate in beats per minute so let's do that you have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19, 20, 21. So you would do 21 times 6, and 21 times 6 is 126. So that's over 100 beats per minute. Okay, so this would be atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response or AFib with RVR. Okay, so that's the interpretation of this uh, rhythm, underlying rhythm here. So hopefully that makes sense. Now in our course, we discuss Ashman phenomenon, and this is where we have aberrantly conducted B, pretty much a functional right bundle branch block. Uh, that can occur uh, due to a long refractory period, okay? So uh, we go over that there. We won't get into that right here. Maybe I'll put a lecture out in a little bit on that. But anyways, let's just recap here. So a few different mechanisms we saw. We said we need an inciting event, such as a premature atrial contraction that may pretty much set this off. You need that substrate as well, okay? And what we see on the EKG, and that's kind of what I wanted to show you here, are these indiscernible absent P waves with an irregularly irregular ventricular rate. Remember, this is the most common irregularly irregular rhythm. The atrial activity is represented by fibrillatory or those small F waves with no organized pattern, as we saw here. We saw almost an isoelectric baseline, right? Not much coarse or maybe fine AFib. 
And then we were able to classify the ventricular rate, and that's important, okay? Because there's two different strategies we can use. We can either use rhythm control or rate control, and often uh, we end up doing uh, rate control because there haven't been really much difference in outcomes in those. So rate is important to be able to control in these patients, and we saw that if the patient has a rate of less than 60 beats per minute, and again, these are our adult patients, that would be a slow ventricular rate. If it's between 60 and 100, that would be a controlled ventricular rate. And if it's over 100, we call that rapid ventricular rate. Here we saw an example of atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate, or AFib with RVR. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website, and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100, more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter. Okay, so completely separate from what you're getting online for free. Okay, these are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book okay and then you also have the pocket guide available so you can choose which format they are the same thing both these uh, book and the pocket guide uh, different formats uh, i really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go now with the book you also get videos so notice these are the videos okay and these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic and it's used now among many institutions so use uh, check that out now what it also includes are calipers so yes you get calipers with this course okay um, i don't know anyone else that offers that but you do get calipers i think they're very helpful and they can uh you know if you know how to use them correctly uh can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on okay and then you also get our pocket EKG reference. Okay, this was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there. Very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic, in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So Go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay. A lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay. You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay, and you find yourself using other resources which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right, have a great day.